You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, third international webinar organized by the International Network for Criminal Justice. Uh, this time, the, the topic is, um, is uh, of course, probation for us. Uh, and uh, it's just an opening up of the conversation about how the, the experience of rapid change during the pandemic has affected practice uh, and what will be the long-term impact of, um, on the supervision of offenders uh, in, the, in the community. How we are very much interested in how the technology and how the online uh, will actually change the experience of uh, supervision for both the probation staff and also for the um, for the for the probationers. Um, this the, the the next few minutes will be used for um, gathering uh, time, so uh, participants will have time to to connect uh, to to us uh, using different uh, channels. Um, and we will start at uh, one o'clock uh, British time. Uh, what we can say uh, before we start is that we have, uh, we have about 100 participants uh, who uh, uh, registered uh, using the Evanbright uh, platform. And we hope to see uh, all of them, if not uh, even more of them, uh, more than 100 people in the in the event today. Uh, the event will be recorded. That's that's important to to mention for for everybody. Uh, we would very much like to have to keep this seminar as a as a kind of conversation. We want to uh, to have the opportunity to talk among uh, each other and to talk to the participants. So please use the comments and the and the chat facility in the in the Zoom. So. Uh, let us know what you think, what, you, what your comments are, what the questions you have. Um, of course, you can also um, uh, use Twitter. The Twitter account is uh, Diez Int uh, CJ Network. I hope I pronounced that properly for uh, uh, everybody. Um, and if you want to know more about our um, uh, events, please go and visit our uh, website. Uh, where you can find a lot of uh, your interesting materials, including the recordings from the previous uh, seminars. Uh, the last one was uh, was a big success, uh, dedicated to restorative uh, restorative justice. Uh, the next two seminars will be uh, dedicated to decolonization, culture, and communities, and will be moderated by uh, Professor Rob Canton. Uh, on the 3rd and the 17th of June. So uh, please uh, save the date uh, in your diary uh, if you want to come and uh, see us again uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. Um, I think we still have a few minutes uh, until we, uh, we start. Uh, hopefully participants are uh, gathering and uh, we will be able to, to start on, uh, uh, on time. Is everybody ready? Yeah, okay. We have good sound, good system, good, good video. Everything is in good shape, so we can, uh, uh, we can start. Uh, without further ado, I would suggest we, we start. Uh, already, I think it's uh, almost uh, one o'clock, so we can uh, we can kick the start. Um, again, welcome everybody. For those who, who connected a little bit uh, uh, later, um, welcome to the third uh, seminar organized by International Network of Criminal Justice. Uh, this seminar will be dedicated to to online and to to the use of uh, technology in the supervision practice. I think this topic is very uh, important for both uh, probation of uh, uh, staff, but also probationers. Uh, and we would like to look at this uh, topic from three, let's say, uh, perspectives. Uh, what, uh, how, the, how the technology was used uh, before, uh, how the technology was used during, and how the technology and online will be used after the pandemic. 
Um, we are hoping to have a, to, to having a, a, a conversation, a, an open conversation. We are not. Uh, we are encouraging you to to be as active as possible. So please use use the chat functions, and ask your questions, make your comments, and we will do our best to uh, involve you in the uh, in the main conversation. We have uh, uh, an interesting lineup for uh, for today. We have. Uh, uh, as I said uh, previously, uh, participants from over 20 countries, more than 100 participants, we, we hope. And we also have um, um, presenters coming from uh, different parts of the world. Uh, we have uh, uh, presenters from uh, England and uh, Wales. We have uh, presenters from uh, United States, um, yeah. uh, from Ireland, uh, and so on. So uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of uh, interesting uh, things to share. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, to introduce uh, my co-chair, uh, Sonia Flynn. Um, Sonia is uh, uh, is the executive director, chief probation officer, and uh, women for Her Majesty Prison and Probation Service uh, in England and Wales, where she's uh, she has the lead of uh, effective practice development. Sonia has the background as a chief executive in Surrey and uh, Sussex. Uh, probation Trust and was Director of Operations for London Probation Trust. I hope I didn't miss anything essential, Sonia. No, no, you didn't. Thank you. That's um, a lovely introduction. Um, and obviously, as with everyone on this call, the last 12 months have probably been the most memorable in my 30-odd year a career in probation. We've learned an enormous amount in terms of the application of digital um, resources into the supervision of offenders. Important lessons, which I'm sure we will be discussing today in respect of how we deliver services for the future. From my point of view, it's probably accelerated our application of digital functions by about five years in England and Wales. So while we were quite well advanced in terms of every probation officer in our country having a laptop and an iPhone, we certainly weren't using the um, video conferencing functions like we are today as um, pre-pandemic, we were still very reliant on face-to-face -face meetings, both in terms of our partnership engagement with other criminal justice agencies, <clears throat> but also we were very wedded to face-to-face um, -face contact with those we supervised. Um, and what we've learned from this pandemic is that we can mix things up it's okay to um, have a former relationship through face-to-face -face contact with supervisees, but it's also okay to contact them by cell phone or video phone. And in fact, some of the early research we've done in England and Wales shows that for some groups of offenders, they actually welcome the opportunity of having um, some remote contact, more frequent contact with their supervising probation officer. And then we've also, as I say, um, secured huge efficiencies in the way we work with other partner agencies. Over the past 12 months, um, we have saved around 50% of our annual budget on staff travel and subsistence. That's important. And I've actually used the savings that we've accrued to actually invest in other important offender services like accommodation for individuals when they leave prison, so some important lessons um, that I'm sure all of you have experienced as well. We've also, during the pandemic, employed, deployed other um, uh, technology. Um, we have started in October of 2020 with the use of alcohol abstinence bracelets, um, which are imposed as a court order. These bracelets are worn for three months and they will inform the probation officer if the individual has had um, any alcohol to drink. Um, the aim is for the offenders to be completely abstinent. So far, the um, early indications are really, really positive. So not completely connected to the pandemic, but just another example of how digital can inform 
the way in which we supervise and improve our approach to both public protection and rehabilitation. So um, I'm co-chair today. <clears throat> There's going to be opportunities for us to have roundtable events when I'll be inviting members of the panel to offer their observations. But most importantly of all, uh, please put your questions in the chat so that myself um, and uh, Professor Doneski can pick those questions up and um, hopefully one of us or the panel of experts can answer. So I think that's my intro. So back to you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Sonia. Thank you. Very impressive developments already uh, mentioned by, uh, by you. I'm looking forward to, to learn more about them. Uh, before going to the, into the, the, the main subject, I would like to introduce the, the uh, members of the panel and the, the, the presenters for, for today. And I would like to, to invite them to spend, let's say, one minute each to introduce uh, yourself. Uh, so who wants to start? Well, I guess I can start. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ron Corbett. I'm with the School of Criminology and Justice Studies at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Most of my life was spent in probation in Massachusetts, which is a state system. I was also uh, for 10 years a court administrator um, and um, at the School of Criminology, I focused mainly on courses in management and leadership, but I've also had a sideline with a colleague in um, investigating the application of cell phone technology to supervision practices. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. Who wants to go next? I don't mind, I'll go. Okay, please. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, really great to be here today. Um, my name is Nick Ballamy and I'm Head of Insights Engagement at HM Prison and Probation Service in England and Wales. Um, so my background is in probation, in probation practice, um, but I'm currently based in HQ. And my role is to support the organisation to apply the best evidence, data and insights to decision making and practice. And over the last year specifically, I've been supporting the probation recovery program to learn from its response to COVID-19. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Shall we go next, uh, Jane? Yes. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. I'm Jane Dominey. Um, I'm a senior research associate at the Institute of Criminology at the University of Cambridge, where most of my research interests are in the areas of probation practice and community supervision. I've been at Cambridge for about 10 years and for my working life before then I was first of all being a probation officer and then after that involved in training of people who were becoming probation officers. During the summer of last year together with colleagues from the Kent Surrey and Sussex Community Rehabilitation Company in England I undertook a research project looking at practice methods skills and technologies being used by community rehabilitation company case managers during the pandemic um, and looking at the experiences that they found valuable and wanted to continue to develop in the future. So I look forward to talking about that with everybody this afternoon. Thank you, Jane. We are also looking forward to, to that. Shall we move on to Anna, please? Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and opportunity to take part of this session. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anna Scarra. I'm an associate professor at the University of Barcelona in the Department of Social Work. And I'm also the policy and liaison officer of CEP, the Confederation of European Probation. I'm sure that most of you already know what CEP is, but just very briefly to mention that CEP is the European Network Organization for Probation Bodies, and our aim is to promote the social inclusion of offenders through community sanctions and measures. And before working for CEP, I have been working many years uh, at the Catalan Ministry of Justice, developing treatment programs for young offenders and their families in the community and also penal institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Very impressive. 
shall we move on to another impressive uh, uh, presenter? Uh, Vivian, please. Thank you, Jan. My name is Vivian Gearan. Uh, I'm a social worker by training. I worked for 33 years in the Irish Probation Service, the last seven of those years uh, as director of the service, from which I retired at the end of 2019. And since then, I'm now an adjunct assistant professor in the School of Social Work and Social Policy in Trinity College, Dublin. Um, I'm also involved in a number of other initiatives, including the Sentencing Guidelines and Information Committee here in Ireland, and as I say, some, some other um, uh, bodies and initiatives. So it's, it's great to be here again. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian. As I mentioned already, uh, uh, an exciting lineup of uh, presenters and panelists. I'm sure we're going to have very exciting discussions. Um, now we can uh, uh, go back to Sonia, so we can uh, we can start with the, with the main presentations. Sonia, please. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so our um, first presentation. Um, is actually from yourself, I understand, Lon, on an introduction to the use of online technology in probation. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, my 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 presentation is uh, is the first one in uh, in, in in the line of these uh, presentations, uh, mainly because my intention is to set up the scene for for uh, having uh, uh, this uh, conversation. Uh, I will try to share some of my views regarding the, the, the kind of uh, development of technology in the supervision industry, let's say. Uh, some of the topics, uh, some of, the, of these ideas might be controversial, uh, and I'm very happy to, to share them with you, and hopefully they will be a good start for the, for the discussions we're going to have later on. Let me share my screen uh, just to show you my beautiful slides okay can you see can you see the slides is everything okay excellent i hope they are large enough so people can uh, can see them okay is it okay colleagues yeah, good, excellent. So the introduction uh, to the use of online technology in probation supervision are we talking about the new probation officer or not? That's uh, my question, and hopefully we're going to be able to answer to, 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 uh, to it a little bit later. Uh, let's look at this uh, uh, question from the historical perspective to see how the, uh, the technology came about in the supervision uh, uh, area. And if we take the large definition of technology as uh, techniques, skills, methods, uh, and processes used in the production of goods and services, you can uh, uh, probably agree with me that uh, um, technology is present in the probation supervision uh, from the very, very beginning of uh, what probation uh, is. Even in the first American uh, early practices, uh, the, the so-called reconnaissance, the practice of reconnaissance, we used to have um, a procedure where the wrongdoers were put under someone's instruction for a while until the next court. Uh, we can find uh, evidence on this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, soft technology, uh, even from the 1630, 1692. Uh, certain types of um, uh, procedures were designed for probation supervision also during the police court missionaries in, uh, uh, in England and Wales. Uh, we used to have peri periodic inquiries uh, to the progress uh, of, the, of the offenders. Uh, later on, after the First World War, and in particular after the Second World War, uh, in the context of uh, uh, casework uh, revolution, we started to innovate with a lot of methods. Uh, again, soft uh, technologies, uh, met methods such as uh, social diagnosis, the treatment plan, case records and assessment and so on. Later on, end, end of the 60s, we saw the rise of the risk assessment um, uh, tools uh, to support the bifurcation uh, strategies. Uh, those with uh, low risk to, to be kept and medium risk to be kept in the community and those with high risk to be, to be sent to, to prison. And in order to do that, of course, we needed some kind of uh, uh, assessment, some kind of screening tools. And uh, this is how risk assessment came about. 
Um, of course, the, 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 the expansion of personal computers in the 70s and 80s uh, improved that practice with uh, electronic forms for these risk assessment uh, tools. In the 90s, we started already to have in England uh, the, the, the OGRS uh, tool that was uh, computerized. Um, and of course, uh, after, after the, the 90s, after the revival of the um, uh, rehabilitation ideal in the so-called something works uh, 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 paradigm, uh, we have uh, a lot of other soft uh, technologies uh, uh, in the shape of uh, different paradigm, practice paradigms like, uh, like R&R, the systems. We also developed a lot of manualized uh, programs. So as you can see, uh, technologies in the in the kind of in their kind of soft uh, uh, version exists in the probation in the supervision uh, uh, area for a very long time and uh, suffered quite a lot of uh, changes in uh, uh, in time. Um, what we can see in the last, let's say, 20 to 30 years, we can see the development, the rise in the development of the hard technologies. Of course, this came together with the expansion of the personal computers. Uh, and the new technologies, uh, and of course the, the the major impact of the of the internet. Uh, in the 1983, we had uh, uh, so, uh, some kind of revolution in the supervision in the community uh, with the with the rise of electronic monitoring. Uh, initially, it was meant only for a small number of house arrest um, um, people. Uh, but later on, it was developed uh, uh, to a very large uh, uh, range of uh, offenders and not only offenders, as uh, we will see probably later. Uh, now we have electronic monitoring with a lot of ads on. We have GPS uh, tagging. We have breathalyzers. We have, uh, as Sonia mentioned already, bracelets that can really do a lot more than just monitoring. Uh, we also have uh, probation kiosks. But what we can see looking at these technologies is that they are mostly passive technologies. They are just recording what is going on. It's a sort of post hoc recording. It's not something that uh, you can interact with. Um, what we saw in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years, uh, we see the rise of the so-called hybrid technologies. Uh, which is a mix between hard and soft technologies. We see the, this, this kind of uh, uh, combination between computer and or internet plus something. Uh, and this is how uh, what I call hybrid technologies uh, because they put these things together, soft and hard, uh, and they develop new uh, products such as uh, digitally enabled programs, uh, and I would strongly uh, advise you to have a look at the TimeWise program uh, that run, uh, runs in the, uh, in the uh, English uh, prisons. It's a program uh, with 10 sessions with uh, very interesting animations that is incorporating uh, Good Lives model, r and and also uh, CBT uh, uh, techniques uh, and runs uh, pretty much without, without a, a facilitator. Um, we speak uh, more and more, if you look around in the uh, United States, in, uh, in England, in Australia as well, in Ireland, Northern Ireland, we speak more and more uh, about the complementary digital media, uh, where the computer is more and more used to support uh, interventions uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, again, what we can see in the last five, uh, five to maybe 10 years, but uh, mostly in the last five years, we can see applications, uh, the apps for the smartphones. We started to speak about uh, supervision by smartphone. Uh, some of them are used only for uh, monitoring compliance, like uh, Telenav in Indiana, for instance, uh, that uh, uh, monitors home detention and drug treatment. But uh, more and more, we see uh, applications that are more interactive. Uh, not only uh, uh, passive uh, uh, recording data, but also uh, being able to communicate with, uh, uh, with the users. For instance, Neighborhood Opportunity Network in New York encourages positive uh, uh, behavior. It has a, a kind of point system uh, where the people, uh, where the probationers are encouraged, motivated to keep going on a good, uh, on a good, uh, in the good direction. Uh, in Europe, we also have uh, the Changes Lives, uh, the, the application developed by our colleagues uh, in Northern Ireland. 
Um, and we have more and more applications that are integrating uh, not only services for the uh, for the probationers, but also for for the for the staff. What we can see is that uh, some of the the newest applications are uh, uh, acting also as um, uh, for case management, so supporting staff to plan, to organize, and to record data regarding their interventions. And uh, we have a, an interesting example uh, coming from North uh, Carolina, uh, PO smartphone application, um, which is, I think, a, an interesting uh, uh, development because these sort of applications are not monitoring only uh, probationers, but also the probation staff. Uh, because uh, somebody can really look uh, into those applications and see what has been done uh, with uh, with a particular um, a probationer or client. Uh, again, most of these technologies are still uh, uh, reactive, are still quite uh, uh, quite passive. Although we can see some kind of uh, uh, signs towards uh, uh, interactivity, but. Um, what I think uh, we can talk about uh, nowadays is uh, uh, what I call the hybrid preventive technologies that are coming into the supervision industry. Uh, we see some developments in the electronic monitoring field. For instance, um, uh, I've read recently about uh, uh, the conductive uh, energy devices that should be uh, used for electronic monitoring, whereby uh, probationers can wear some uh, the the bracelets, for instance, and in case the the system detects some kind of uh, risks of uh, uh, escalation uh, or a risk some uh, of of crime, they can send a, a very painful uh, electric impulse, and the person uh, can stop from uh, uh, committing uh, that particular crime. We are also speaking about electronic monitoring as uh, smartwatches, uh, for instance, in New Zealand. Uh, they are now trying to introduce the electronic monitoring with drug and alcohol detectors with uh, telephone functions as well. So it's not only detecting the, um, um, uh, the, the drugs or the alcohol consumption, but uh, the, uh, the probationers can, can also speak to their uh, bracelets and then get in contact with, uh, with the probation uh, uh, officer. Again, we can see some uh, interesting developments in the area of um, artificial intelligence. We, we have more and more data. We have more and more uh, integrated databases uh, that can really open up the, the way towards uh, the rise of algorithms. So um, I can see already artificial intelligence uh, used uh, to some extent in the risk assessment uh, uh, tools in some parts of the of the of the world is already artificial intelligence is already used in a, in a lot of uh, other places for instance in the bank industry in the insurance but also nowadays in the in the preventing policing and um, and uh, so on uh, the rise of online supervision uh, as mentioned already by sonia and i'm sure that we will continue talking about that uh, in the in the next presentations um, uh, was also noted, especially during the pandemic uh, in the last in the last year. Uh, of course, this uh, this was done uh, in the context of reduced direct contact, but uh, we also noticed in different uh, studies that uh, we still don't have enough technology, uh, we still don't have enough equipment, we don't we still don't have enough know how how to use these technologies in order to maximize the potential of this online. Uh, supervision. It's not clear yet uh, to what extent this online supervision is uh, uh, effective. Uh, we don't even know, we don't, we, we didn't even agree how to measure the impact of, uh, of online supervision, if we shall, we shall measure it as uh, normal uh, supervision or we should have different uh, uh, indicators uh, around uh, compliance or reoffending. Uh, but what we can definitely say is that uh, most of the probation staff is quite dissatisfied with uh, uh, with uh, with the online supervision a lot of probation staff complained about um, uh, the lack of direct contact the risk of uh, damaging the quality of relationship and so on so what we can see from these new developments that are taking place in the in the last two three four years maybe five is that we are moving towards a more uh, preventive technology, not only reactive, not only recording data about what happened, but also 
trying to introduce uh, uh, technologies that are anticipating, are uh, uh, predicting uh, what uh, what might happen, and even more, uh, if we are talking about the dirty technologies as they are called by uh, by Mike Nellis. Um, they can even uh, incapacitate people to uh, commit some uh, uh, some crimes. So the major the major uh, current uh, uh, trends in the use of technologies uh, to summarize is that uh, I think we are talking more and more about the hybrid technologies. Uh, to remind you, uh, are those technologies that are putting together computer, internet plus something. Uh, we have more and more uh, discussions about reactive, but also preventive technologies like uh, interactive electronic monitoring, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, we have more and more online uh, and computer-assisted uh, uh, programs, and I think we have to, to pay attention uh, to, to, to those because I think they have quite a great potential, and I'm not sure that we use that potential to their uh, uh, full. And um, of course, uh, we should pay attention to the developments in the neuropsychology. Uh, I think they are they are not yet in the criminal justice field, but if we look in the in the medical uh, area, uh, in psychiatry or in neurology, we can see quite a lot of uh, developments that are that that can one day impact on the way we uh, we work with uh, with violent people in particular. A few questions uh, for the current uh, uh, and the uh, near future. Uh, and I hope that we will be able to address some of these questions uh, uh, in this meeting. Are can online and artificial uh, intelligence coexist with uh, empathy? Uh, and if yes, how can we find the perfect uh, mix? What are the implications for the privacy rights and other human rights for this kind of developments? Uh, how can the algorithm bi uh, biases uh, be reduced? Uh, for instance, we have more and more evidence that artificial intelligence sends people to jail, as a, a, a recent uh, American newspaper uh, mentioned the other, the other day. Is online effective in reducing reoffending and promoting resistance? And if so, when, how, with whom, and, uh, and so on. And of course, is there a new probation officer? Is there a new... A set of skills that we need to to equip our probation officers in order to be uh, effective in this new environment. Thank you very much. I just would like to conclude that uh, the future is here, in my opinion. But as uh, Gibson uh, said, is not yet uh, evenly distributed. As you can see in this picture, we still have a, a, a combination of all the new, uh, and uh, we are still. Uh, yeah, it, you know, searching for the best way how to conduct our uh, business. Thank you very much. Well, Lone, you've um, certainly given us um, a lot to think about there and thank you <clears throat> for um, a very helpful presentation. You gave a, um, a list of questions in your last slide, might, which might be a good place to start the next session of roundtable comments. Um, and I was particularly taken about with your fourth question about um, the future of online supervision and some of the observations that you made about whether whilst um, this was um, implemented in, in, at speed in most jurisdictions in response to a national health, health crisis, whether it has any legacy and the experience of our own practitioners of operating in this way. I wondered, um, just to start us off, because I'm familiar with this, I know, um, Nick Bellamy, you have been conducting some evaluation of the impact of online supervision, the impact on staff, of remote working. Um, would you would you like to pick that up first as a way to start us off? Yes, happy to. Thanks, Sonia. It's a really interesting presentation. Um, and a lot of the things that you talked about there have really resonated with me. And um, as Sonia um, spoke about at the, at the, in her introduction, you know, in England and Wales, I think it's fair to say that we would not have considered rolling out remote supervision so soon and so quickly if it hadn't been for the pandemic and I'm sure it's the same for, for most people. So prior to the pandemic um, we had 
uh, an IT rollout in probation, but it was fairly new. We were still trying to get used to things like Skype and MS Teams and, and, and sort of uh, the online platforms that are available to us. But people on probation were expected to attend the office for, for their appointments. And, um, and also our staff were expected to work in the office, so nine to five mostly. So things changed quite rapidly when the pandemic hit. And I think what we need to look at now is distinguishing between what we had to do as a result of the pandemic out of necessity and now what we should or could do isn't it, for the future. And a big part of that is learning from our staff and our uh, staff experiences and the people who um, are receiving our services as well. I think for me, the key thing is that there's not a great deal of existing evidence and research yet around the effectiveness of online supervision. But what we do have is a real robust evidence base around what makes effective supervision work. And I think we need to keep bringing ourselves back to that um, and, and, and relying on the evidence we have. Um, and then thinking about how does digital or online supervision impact on the effectiveness of our work. Um, so I, I picked up on something that um, you mentioned about staff being dissatisfied. I think for us, it's been a real mix. Um, I think the clear message from our staff is let's not go back to the way things were. Let's let's definitely look at what worked and how we can um, use that and exploit that and, and create opportunities and be more creative, I suppose, in how we deliver our services. But I think there's still a lot of um, anxiety about using technology um, and trust, um, especially around risk management and things like that. And if you're not seeing someone face to face, you know, can you can you feel confident in yourself that you're, you're managing risk remotely? So for me, I think it's early days. We've definitely um, seen some really great practice. We've definitely seen that we can do things differently. But let's exercise a little bit of caution and keep listening to what people are saying and relying on the evidence. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. I'm now going to hand over to Anna because um, CEP, uh, the Council for European Probation, have um, coordinated a lot of um, learning from many, many jurisdictions. So I wondered, Anna, if you'd like to offer some observations, what you've seen across different uh, European states. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you very much, Yuan, for your interesting presentation. Actually, I was thinking about it while you were presenting. And uh, more than giving answers on your questions, I actually would like to raise another question just to reflect and to think about it. Um, related to the first, but also to the last question you made, Joan, uh, which referred to the new set of skills for probation officers in this new technological environment. One of the questions that came from different European jurisdictions during the COVID-19 pandemic is how the Working Alliance can be created through this online supervision. Uh, as, you, as you already know, many probation services, many probation officers around Europe, around the world, had to um, deliver, do their interviews through online communication tools, telephones, WhatsApp video calls, Zoom video calls, and so on. And how this alliance with the client can be created in such a, let's say, can I call it cold environment? Distancing environment? What do you think about it? What, what are your feelings? What, what happened in your jurisdictions? Yes, if I, if I may pick up on that, uh, Anna, uh, I, I think we can, uh, I, I think we don't have enough evidence now from, from, uh, from the probation supervision, not yet. But I'm sure that in the near future, we will start developing knowledge around this, uh, this topic. But what we can do, I think, safely is to look at uh, in, the neighbor, uh, in the neighboring areas, for instance, in the psychotherapy, where actually we learn quite a lot that actually supervision and uh, psychotherapy can take place in the online environment. Uh, we have already evidence that uh, uh, the, the body is not necessarily better than the screen, as they, they like to put it. So I think under certain conditions, we can use the online in order to provide um, uh, effective uh, supervision. Of course, 
the evidence take, takes uh, take us to in a direction of uh, a, a more hybrid approach where online is mixed with offline uh, uh, interventions when, let's say, the first meeting and the second maybe to take place uh, in person. And then later on, you can, you know, use the online in order to facilitate the, the, the supervision in this, uh, this kind of environment. So I think if we look in the, uh, uh, if we look around, I think we have, uh, we can see some encouraging uh, uh, signs that uh, it, it is possible to use online under certain conditions and with some types of, uh, or so, some, some groups of uh, uh, people. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, and I think that with this answer, you, you also gave an answer to the first question about can artificial intelligence coexist with empathy and how would be the exact mixture? And you said hybrid, hybrid activities, doing activities face-to-face, -face, combining them with online. So I think that would be a good mix, a good uh, approach. What do the other panel members think about it? Vivian, would you like to come in at this point? Because <clears throat> I think particularly given your current role in terms of sentencing advice, we don't act in isolation. And I think we also have to take the views of our key stakeholders, the judiciary particularly, and whether they would view completely online supervision as justice being done. So I don't know if you could take it up from that angle, Vivian. Yeah, in, in, in terms of that specific question, Sonia, I, I don't think so. The answer is no. I, I don't think that that would be uh, a flyer in terms of, of a 100% approach. I was struck by a few things during uh, Johan's presentation, which was really interesting and very thought-provoking, and particularly the way he uh, divided up, in a sense, the different types of, of technology. Um, I do think technology is here to stay. You know, what, whatever we have now is is here to say, is here to stay. I do think we need to learn lessons from the past in relation to uh, specific technology like electronic monitoring um, and you know probation service managements and staff. Uh, certainly in these islands, and I'll just speak about Ireland, would have resisted that um, that type of technology. And really, it doesn't go away. And I think we need to see how it can be adapted and used in specific uh, instances or types of programs or whatever. I do think the pandemic has shown across a whole lot of public sector areas what can be done. Uh, and aspects of that have been really good. I mean, I, I sit on the on the board of the Analyphy Drug Project, for example, and things that uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, were said to be impossible in terms of service delivery, literally changed overnight in terms of how services were made more accessible to uh, clients and so on. I think also the, 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 the aspect of the impact on staff has been mentioned, and I think we have to fully get to grips with how, you know, with the, with the full extent of, of that, because my sense of the pandemic and its impact on services is um, because we've been reacting, you know, to use that, that phrase that uh, Johan used as well, you know, we've been trying to cope with certain things and deal with things and deliver services as best we can. But my sense is that after the pandemic moves on, that there'll be a certain leveling off and some things will slump back to in the direction of where they were some things will will keep going and some further things may be developed and to some extent there will be other aspects of damage that will need to be picked up that are currently hidden so i, I think to some extent we're in we're, we're in a coping phase at the moment which people on a whole lot of levels have dealt with very well whether they're service users or you know people delivering services but i i do think there will be a kind of a of a re-establishing e uh, equilibrium when when all that is over i'm also conscious then of the you know the issue of while organizations have had to make technology including in ireland more available to staff there are big numbers of of our service users who don't have access to that and as has been said already uh, and going back to my original point uh, i do think that there are, are pluses there are positives but I think we need to see where, where the gaps will remain and how we can, how we can adapt the hybrid as described by Johan 
uh, in order to deliver the you know the, the the best and the most flexible and most responsive services in the future. Just one last point. I'm conscious. Uh, as a former probation officer, about the whole area of community service, and I'm, you know, that's that doesn't, in 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 my understanding, lend itself to the type of technology uh, applications that that we've been talking about because of the nature of it. And finally, I would just say that probation practice, for me, at its core, is a relational thing. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have you know that relational uh, interaction through the use of technology. Um, but uh, for me, the technology will always be an adjunct to what is at the core of uh, probation practice. Well, Vivian, uh, those are certainly observations that I would absolutely um, agree with. And your comments about digital poverty certainly came to the forefront during the pandemic, I'm sure, in every jurisdiction which is why this um, next presentation from Ron Corbett on cell phones to the rescue will be so pertinent. Um, cell phones certainly um, rescued me. <laughs> so, um, so your title of your presentation certainly made me smile, Ron. So please, over to you. Thank you, Sona. Uh, hello to everyone from Boston, where it's eight degrees Celsius. Um, uh, the, so the topic of my presentation is the utility of cell phone technology uh, to improve community supervision outcomes. That's what I'll be focusing on. Um, I should say in advance that I'm going to do this without a net, which is to say uh, I'm not going to employ uh, any PowerPoint presentations except for one graphic at the very end. So it's up to me to be interesting enough to get away with that. Um, there are a couple of preliminary, preliminary remarks I should make. One is my remarks are based on the experience in the United States. And while I think there is uh, some universal applicability, uh, perhaps to some of the points I make, I know that maybe some things won't transfer quite as well. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm limited in my knowledge of practice uh, around the world. So I don't want to go too far in uh, making claims uh, for what I say to be universal. So I, I thought I would say that. The second thing is the uh, thoughts I'm going to share grew out of work. I did with a colleague at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, uh, Professor April Padovina, and she deserves a huge amount of credit for the ideas that we developed, which were supported by a grant from the National um, Science Foundation. So um, uh, the way I would like to structure this is around three questions, uh, which I'll try to answer in the time that I have. First is, what is the problem that we were trying to address when we first started talking to each other and thinking about uh, how cell phones could be uh, a positive force in uh, community supervision? Uh, the second was, uh, what are the key insights to keep in mind in fashioning a solution employing cell phone tech? technology? What are the understandings that are important to go forward with an application um, or a software that, that actually makes sense? And the third is what would uh, such a solution uh, really look like? Uh, and some of that has been uh, touched on already uh, by Professor Donescu and others. So uh, first, the problem. Uh, we became interested in thinking about this um, as a byproduct of the discussion of mass incarceration, which is a, uh, you know, a more salient issue perhaps in the United States than most places. Uh, but that became a very strong topic of conversation. Um, uh, you know, eight, eight or nearly 10 years ago now, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, was a great catalyst for discussion, but a variety of things uh, made that a major topic of conversation. So, as we began to unpack that issue, we noticed that one factor, uh, which initially, I think, got very little attention, uh, began to get uh, capture our attention and eventually the, the attention of many others. And that was the contribution to new prison admissions every month made by those in violation or in breach of their parole or probation uh, conditions. And the numbers which have stayed fairly constant as I've watched them, particularly out of uh, the Council of State Governments and others, is that uh, 
it, it wouldn't be uncommon in a state in uh, the United States for up to 50% of new prison admissions being probation and parole violators. When that got further unpacked, about half of those, or 25% of new prison admissions, were what we call technical violators. That is, or what I would call rule breakers, not law breakers. Uh, folks who were uh, not able to stay in compliance with the requirements of their supervision had not committed a crime. So one out of four new prison admissions were folks who were being sent to prison because they were rule breakers. To our uh, mind, um, that raised some very serious questions as to whether that was, in, in the context of a big discussion about mass incarceration, that was a good use, an appropriate or fair or just use of the incarceration option. And we felt strongly it wasn't. Um, so that led us to think about uh, what could be done to reduce the incidence of um, folks being sent to, to prison for what, I, again, what I would call rule breaking. Um, now, uh, the, uh, there are two policy questions that bear on this that don't have to do with cell phone technology, but they warrant a uh, brief mention. One is, in our understanding, one of the biggest problems was what I would call the load that is placed on probation and parolees. That is the uh, multiplicity of requirements uh, that were a condition of release into the community. Um, looking at it across the nation and the load varied from state to state, but more often than not, I think it would be fair to say it was a very heavy load uh, with numerous, sometimes conflicting requirements. Um, and as we looked at it, uh, something that the average citizen we thought would have difficulty complying with, let alone folks who are struggling with, with a number of issues. So policy matter uh, was, you know, can we rethink what it is we require people to do to stay in good standing? Uh, what, what's really feasible? Um, and the second policy question was, how about alternatives to responding to rule breaking other than incarceration. And I don't think I need to go into that. Uh, you know, it, 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 we've talked about alternative sentences for a long time now in the States and elsewhere, and certainly felt that if there was any good candidate for an alternative sentence, non-incarceration sentence, it was, it was these rule breakers. Um, now, uh, so that led us to, uh, beyond the policy question, that led us in order to think about what a cell phone could do to ask ourselves, well, what, what's causing the breach? Where, where are uh, probationers and parolees falling short? And two major categories uh, were a failure to show up for a variety of appointments, meetings with probation officers, treatment meetings, testing meetings, community service meetings, AA meetings, and um, things of that nature. So there were a variety of appointments, so to speak, um, that people were missing, and this was one of the major reasons. The second was the failure to uh, come through with uh, payments on, on financial uh, penalties. Um, now, as to the first one, I have to say we sort of had a light bulb moment with a book that some of you may know, but in the midst of this discussion, we started paying attention to a book entitled uh, Scarcity, which uh, some of you uh, may be familiar with. Um, two social scientists, Mueller Nathan and Schaefer, uh, one from Harvard and the other from Princeton, published this book in 2013. And um, the title again was Scarcity, Why Having Too Little Means So Much. Um, complex work, but let me try to summarize it uh, as, as succinctly as I can. Their basic insight was, that people who are in financial distress uh, have uh, some cognitive fallout uh, that they've, they discovered in their own um, research, laboratory research and, and other types of research. And that is that there was a narrowing of focus. Um, a, a, uh, the entire cognitive bandwidth was taken up with survival. 
Uh, people in financial distress uh, have, pro have to worry about food, shelter, and clothing. And uh, it, it, at least in us, and again, I've, I had long years of experience in probation, started as an officer and ended as the commissioner. But it, it was certainly the case that a majority of the folks we were supervising had financial challenges um, and looked at one way, that's a full-time job. To be able to provide in the course of a month for food, shelter, and clothing can take up all of your energy and attention. And this is certainly what the researchers in the book Scarcity found. Th theirs was not uh, done for criminal justice purposes, but I would argue has great applicability. If most of the people we supervise have financial challenges. They're full up just trying to, to provide for themselves, let alone uh, stay in compliance with the multiplicity of requirements, the load that was uh, the load that was placed on them. So, with that in mind, um, oh, the, oh, let me mention the second one. So, the second area where that brought forth a lot of violations was uh, financial penalties. Now, here, um, the, my short answer is they are inappropriate in the vast majority of cases. That's uh, a controversial issue in the states. But um, I can tell you that uh, looking, doing a research around the country, we found many instances where people who had no financial wherewithal at all were being held responsible for fees and fines, uh, which they couldn't come forward with, at least not in a legitimate way, and were subject to um, imprisonment as a result of that. It's in an article I wrote, I referred to it as soaking the poor. and. Um, I think there's a serious question as to, at least in the States, as to the role of financial penalties. I would be happy uh, to just means test them. And if that was the case, I, I'm satisfied a great majority would uh, not, be determined not to be able to make any sort of um, a financial payment at all. Um, so um, the uh, second thought we had is what I would refer to as. Um, the curse of bad psychology. And here, what I'm referring to is a style of supervision or an approach that uh, puts the emphasis on warnings and threats and uh, focusing on um, catching people doing something wrong, uh, looking for violations, uh, heavy surveillance and enforcement uh, orientation, and um, a style of supervision too often, and this wasn't the case in all, I don't want to say this was the case in all systems in the States, but uh, uh, this was something that was a fairly common phenomenon that the mindset was uh, detection and enforcement uh, more than support and insistence. There was always a mix of both, but the first one seemed to get heavier weight in many places than the others. The problem with this is when the reason I say a curse of bad psychology is it really stands in violation of everything we know about behavior modification um, and what works in changing folks' behavior. And you know, the, the jury came back on that a long time ago. The verdict is in. Uh, positive reinforcement, catching people doing something right, uh, whether you're a teacher or a, a coach uh, or a parent for that matter, is really what is much more effective in shaping future behavior than uh, remonstrating uh, and being on the lookout and, and, and being conspicuously on the lookout for, for people uh, screwing up. This also, we thought, compromised the essential alliance that has to take place for successful outcomes uh, between those on probation and parole and the officers uh, that are supervising them. Through uh, hundreds of interviews, I've been fortunate, both when I was active and uh, as a, in probation and afterwards, hundreds of uh, folks on probation or recently on probation in small groups, it, it became very clear that they picked up within the first meeting or so what the orientation of their probation officer was. Was the probation officer putting all of his or her eggs in the basket of warnings and tracking and detecting and surveillance um, or in the basket of uh, help, support, encouragement, positive reinforcement. And this is not an either or, this is not a binary. We all know that probation officers have a job to do and they're 
They're, they, you, you know, they have to be firm about holding people to responsibilities. The question is one of balance and whether the psychology that is a common sense matter we know works in all those other domains, including parenting, uh, could be brought over to, uh, uh, to supervision. You know, you, you uh, hear the work of Jennifer Scheme at Berkeley. Um, uh, Professor Donesco, I think, mentioned therapists. And there's an interesting correspondence between the characteristics of successful therapists and successful probation officers. And it's all captured in Jennifer and her colleagues' wonderful article, which is called Firm, Fair, and Caring, um, which, I, which I recommend to uh, everyone. So uh, how can, um, I'll use these last few minutes to say, how can cell phones help? Well, let me identify six, six things very quickly, which we think cell phones can do that are very constructive. First of all, they can send reminders regularly of appointments. Uh, pro, at least in the States, probationers do not keep date books. That is just is not in the equation at all. Uh, to, for reasons I've mentioned already, they're, they're too busy trying to figure out where to stay that evening and how they're gonna feed themselves and whatnot. So reminders on a regular basis, like we get from our doctors and others, uh, is a very positive move. The second thing is uh, congratulating people through cell phone text when they do something positive. It could be a negative drug test. It could be uh, completing a certain number of community service hours, meeting with the probation officers three times in a row, uh, things of this nature, looking for opportunities to catch people doing something right and sending them a positive uh, message about that. Identification of services, being able to use the cell phone to find needed services, housing, substance abuse treatment, uh, whatever it might be, signing up for unemployment insurance. Uh, that cell phone can be used for wellness checks. Just one or two question surveys. How are you feeling today? If it's someone who's in really struggling with drugs and alcohol, you know, how are the cravings today? Things of that sort. Uh, inspirational and educational messages, little mini lessons, maybe along the cognitive behavioral line, just a, a hint or a guidance or a tip for that day. We also looked at, although uh, tracking technology is very controversial in, in the States, we wondered whether tracking could be used uh, in a very positive way. Let me give an example. If we know that um, uh, someone has not uh, left their house for three days, uh, that, that might be a good occasion for a probation officer to pick up the phone in between appointments and call and say, is everything okay? If it's, and, and all of this is technologically possible, if someone establishes a pattern of movement uh, in a typical week and suddenly departs from it, the point here is not uh, surveillance for the sake of primarily of, uh, of, of finding trouble, but of, of seeing somebody heading for trouble and being able to interrupt that uh, uh, sleep patterns, as you know, are very easily uh, discovered uh, through cell phones now. So a disturbed sleep pattern. The point here is opportunities for positive intervention. So to sum up, what we think we're um, doing here is conveying what to me, and here I draw on my experience in probation more than anything else. The subtext here is a message to people on probation parole. We are trying our best to support and help in, in uh, your effort to stay in compliance with the orders of the court. And, and all of this is about finding ways in between appointments, because one of the biggest problems in probation, I think at least in the States, is we're trying to really affect people by seeing them only very intermittently. And cell phone is sort of, in my view, an assistant probation officer an adjunct, as the term was used by Vivian, to not, it's not an either or, it's a helpmate to probation officers to maintain contact in between face-to-face uh, -face appointments. Now, I'll end just with an example. Rob, if you could just uh, put that graphic. Now, full disclosure here, uh, this is, UpTrust is an organization that is devoted to the development of software applications that will help keep people out of jail and prison. I am on the advisory board to UpTrust. This is not a commercial. It's just a, a graphic to demonstrate how this um, happens in the real world. There are other um, uh, vendors, surely, but uh, you, can see, you can see the language there. It's very positively oriented, improve outcomes, 
Uh, what are the functions support people, automated messaging, improve uh, with two-way uh, communication, connect people with resources, act as a coach uh, rather than a referee, um, and uh, you know, reduce uh, technical violations. Um, and all in all, to use the cell phone to, um, to, to communicate a positive um, approach to helping, you know, their success is our success. Um, again, I think the work of Tom Tyler, which you're probably familiar with, procedural justice, procedural fairness, in my view, at the end of a very long career, it's what is communicated, frankly, from the probation officer to the person under supervision that is the most important independent variable affecting outcome. I will just close uh, with this um, one sentence quote from a David Brooks article in the New York Times this week, uh, which stopped me in my tracks and got me to be thinking in that quote is, people only change after they felt they're understood. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Corbett. Uh, I think we understood uh, uh, very well your message. Uh, it's, uh, it was very interesting and very uh, informative and also very practical. I really like the, the six points, uh, uh, the, the, the list of the points that uh, the, the telephone can be used for in order to, to support and to, to uh, uh, help uh, the, the supervision process. Uh, I'm sure that Jane will have a lot to comment on uh, on that. I know that she did some research on uh, on uh, on the use of telephone and other technologies in the probation services. But before going to to the panel, I would like to take some of the questions in the in the chat, if you don't mind. Um, we have some questions about, um, and these questions are for everybody, really. Uh, feel free to uh, jump in if you if you if you have a, a, an answer. The first question is coming from uh, Yotso Chatlos from uh, Romania uh, about um, uh, do you th if you think that uh, online supervision must be uh, combined with electronic monitoring? Is that for me, Professor Dinesa? Uh, anybody, anybody, Professor Corbett. If you if you want, well, please. Yeah. Let me, um, it, this goes back to our previous discussion. I hope this is responsive in part. Uh, you know, my take on the question of online supervision versus in person is that the medium, my, my reaction is the medium is not the message. It's the person on the screen or across the desk that matters. So I can imagine, and, and obviously we want some combination, but I think the folk, I think it's wrong in a way to think about whether it's the technology or the in-person presence that's decisive, independent of who is the person and what and how are they conducting their business, which is to say that I think a really good probation officer can do fantastic work online. And the difference between that and a face-to-face -face presentation would be very small. On the other hand, probation officers who are not well-trained or not, not uh, well-motivated uh, can, uh, can conduct only face-to-face the contacts and they could be a disaster. So I'm less, um, I'm less uh, persuaded that it's the means of communication that is decisive uh, than I am that it's the person doing the communicating, which opens up the opportunity for use of, of online meetings uh, in a potentially positive, uh, in a potentially positive way. As, as regards for electronic monitoring, as you know, uh, the, the, uh, uh, those uh, in the States are often, you know, separate pieces of technology, anklets or whatever, but, um, you know, there is obviously the potential to uh, incorporate that for those who want to uh, into cell phone technology. I hope that was at least partially responsive. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Corbett. Anybody else would like to, to contribute? No, then I, I think we can go to the next question uh, from uh, Christina Teorok, uh, asking about if there is any uh, funds available in Europe to support these uh, uh, transformations. Um, and for that, I think I have a, a, a brief answer, and then of course uh, you can you can also contribute if you want. Uh, from uh, December last year, the European Commission has a new uh, strategy for training. Um, for the next uh, four years, 
um, and uh, probation officers together with uh, prison officers are also uh, recognized as priority uh, for for uh, among uh, other professional groups in the in the criminal justice or in in justice in general actually and uh, there will be funds available for uh, for training so uh, I think for the European audience, I think it's important to look at the, the, the strategy for training for judiciary uh, and uh, prepare for, you know, uh, applying for, for, for these funds to, to support these transformations, at least from the training perspective. Uh, another question, uh, if, if somebody else would like to jump in, to chip in to, for this question? No? Okay, good. Then we can uh, move on to, to uh, another very interesting question about experiencing supervision. Uh, are we aware of any uh, study or any, uh, any uh, research on the on the topic of experiencing supervision? Um, so the, the service user perspective with the new digital services. Yes, please, please, Nick. Well, I'm sure Jane can offer a really good perspective on this as well um, because I know she's been directly involved in research which we've um, taken on board as part of our learning in, in, in England and Wales but I think listening to experiences is absolutely crucial and you know we've really made a huge effort to do that throughout the pandemic so during the first wave um, really paying attention to what our staff and the people on probation were saying looking at what our external partners were saying looking at our scrutiny reports looking at our data and, and triangulating triangulating that and keeping it live, making sure that's being fed back into the system consistently. Um, and then that really helped us to plan for what we knew would be a second wave, contingency planning, and also making small changes, but also then looking at, you know, look, we, we're starting to see things here which could actually work long term. So we were already starting to get ideas about that. I think the key thing about listening is that every, every person has experienced this pandemic differently. Um, and I think we've always had to keep that on board. So I, I really liked something I saw on social media once where someone said, uh, we're not in the same, we're not in the same boat. We're all on different boats in the same thunderstorm. And I think that's really important because I, you, you can't make assumptions about how people have experienced this. And we've really taken that on board in terms of um, our learning. So understanding that just because one person has had a positive experience um, with remote supervision, it's not necessarily the same for others and really trying to make an effort to understand how it's impacting and, and, and adapting our services so we we still got a lot to learn on that respect because i know we we there's still lots of groups that we haven't heard from um, some say that um remote supervision and, and digital technology technology has been brilliant for them you know they, they'd love to stay that way forever if they could do all their appointments remotely they would um i've heard from others and saying actually um, having a probation appointment gave me a reason to get up and get dressed and, and come in. It gave me a routine and I can't speak openly on the phone because I've got family, I've got my partner here, I don't want to overhear what I'm saying. And there's all those sort of considerations. Um, so yeah, absolutely, we have to keep listening and keep um, feeding that into our uh, changes. Okay, thank you, Nick. Jane, would you like to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so a couple of things. The study that I did with colleagues last year only gathered data directly from practitioners. So the data that we have about what service users were saying and thinking about telephone supervision is in our study secondhand. But as, as Nick said, there are definitely examples of people who were finding it easier to have valuable and good quality conversations with their supervising officer because they could do it from somewhere where they were feeling safe and comfortable and easy to talk, easier to talk. And there were also people who were having the opposite experience of that. So we're finding that it was difficult to find anywhere to talk to their supervising officer where they weren't overheard or where there wasn't a great deal of background noise. Um, in terms of a di direct answer to the question about uh, service user involvement and service user experience, then the two studies that I know best are 
one that the Scottish Government has done about public services in the pandemic, which has a particular thread about criminal justice, which I can unhelpfully not remember the title of, but the Scottish Government's publishing a number of reports. Um, and then the other one is that the work that Her Majesty's Inspector of Probation has done in England and Wales about supervision during the pandemic did gather some data directly from service users. Um, I have lots more to say on many of the topics that we've already raised this morning about things like risk assessment and things about the difference between, I mean, do we mean the same thing when we talk about telephone supervision and online supervision and the role for things like apps and electronic monitoring and data and whereabouts data, but I'm sure that we'll come to some of those later in our discussions. Yes, thank you, Jane, thank you. Uh, I think the same uh, field, uh, uh, Sutcliffe, uh, also wondered if uh, and what worked uh, well, what are the main challenges in making this uh, transition towards uh, the online? Uh, do we have any helpful answers for this question? Okay, Nick, please. <laughs> I don't want to take over. <laughs> we, we've, there's lots of things that have worked well. Um, one of the things we first noticed was that our compliance had um, increased quite a lot during the pandemic. We first started rolling this out, but we had to exercise caution around that because what we didn't know was what was the quality of that conversation, you know, compliance. If someone picks up the phone, is that complying? Um, because I, I always remember one, one probation officer to saying to me it's just as easy for them to put the phone down um, as it is to pick it up and I suppose it's a bit more difficult to walk out of a room when you're sat face to face with someone you can use your sort of skills to engage that person and, and, and you know if, even if they get upset you know you their tr probation officers are trained to sort of keep people in the room and keep that conversation going whereas when you've got someone on the phone you don't really know whether they're properly engaged they could be on Facebook or you know and, and as I said it's quite easy for them to terminate the interview and, and what we were hearing is that telephone interviews seem to be a lot shorter for that respect but we, we've we've heard some um really great stories from our staff and our service users around things about especially around well-being so using digital te technology we had a lot of um people who were isolated or shielding um and, um, you know, just having someone checking on their well-being, um, you know, and, and, and doing those checks when they perhaps didn't have anyone else to talk to and sort of gestures of kindness. Um, our staff were developing things like distraction packs, well-being packs. Um, and we've also developed sort of toolkits that probation staff can use as well. So whereas our accredited programmes, the group programmes we had to suspend for some time, we've been really creative in terms of coming up with and toolkits that uh, our staff can use either face-to-face -face or remotely. Okay, thank you, Nick, very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can we can move on to, to another very interesting uh, uh, question coming from Maria Jimena Monsalve about the use of online uh, supervision with domestic violence uh, cases. How do you see it? How do, how do you see the possibility of providing supervision online with uh, this group of domestic violence. Shall I come in there? Because I, I think that there's two issues here. I, I think there's things that um, protect agencies that look after victims have deployed differently during the pandemic. Um, so certainly in England, creating safe spaces for women during lockdown was really important so they could access victim contact and we saw the introduction of, of safe spaces in our supermarkets and pharmacies. That was largely a kind of police-based initiative because a lot of the victim support services um, weren't available, or if they were, they were all online. So if the woman did try and contact them, perhaps the abusive partner would, would hear them trying to contact them. So these new safe spaces were put into, as I say, supermarkets, pharmacies, places where women could would legitimately go to, to, to shop and wouldn't arouse attention. So I think that answers part of Maria's question. I mean, in terms of oversight of um, perpetrators of domestic violence, um, 
We certainly reoffending during the lockdown from contact with police colleagues seemed to fall, and that's because the opportunity to commit further crime was curtailed by the national lockdown. People couldn't leave their properties and go and be abusive to another person. Um, the opportunities to drink alcohol were reduced. So a lot of the kind of disinhibitors or environmental factors that would precipitate violence were stopped in outside spaces. I think there's still a lot of unknown about what happened in private, more private spaces. Um, I certainly, um, those um, individuals who were um, at risk of domestic violence perpetrators, as um, Nick has said, we continue to, um, and with the very high risk ones, we would have continued to bring them into offices, socially distant offices, to continue with one-to-one -one treatment options. Um, those being released from prison, um, who again were at higher risk, would have continued to have been seen face to face. But the medium and low risk, we did have to default back to telephone. Um, and it's that group as we begin to unlock that we're keen to re-engage with face to face. Could I just say a word about that? I, uh, my hunch is if it was necessary to prioritize who would get contact on site, meaning at home, uh, I, I would certainly prioritize domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Because it's uh, th those are cases, at least in my experience, and uh, people have different experiences, please say so, where observation, face-to-face -face observation mm -hmm. is very important. First of all, to detect injuries. Uh, you, you may have, I don't know if this is true in Europe, but the incidents reports of uh, domestic violence are down in the United States uh, during the pandemic. I don't think that's because there's less of it. If you think of, of, of the, what circumstances drive domestic violence, I think the uh, sort of existential circumstances increase, but the reports decreased. And I think that has to do with a uh, number of children not going to school anymore where teachers can be observant. Uh, of, um, you know, the kind of condition they're in. And secondly, the decline of face-to-face -face, uh, at home uh, observations, which are uh, a, a great source of picking up on whether a problem continues. It's not just what's said, but what's unsaid or body language or relationships that you can observe when you're conducting a meeting in a home. Anyway, long story short, that's one area where uh, I really do think face-to-face Mm -hmm. at, at the house, uh, at the home, is what I would emphasize there, um, could make a big difference. Can I just add, Johan, that in, in relation to the situation in Ireland, from what I know of it over the past year regarding uh, domestic violence cases, I would agree with what Ron and Sonia have said, um, uh, particularly Sonia's point about here also the Irish Probation Service has prioritized face-to-face -face contact with uh, supervision of um, high-risk um, uh, cases, if you like, um, and particularly in relation to domestic violence. Just to say, though, in relation to one of the points Ron made, the experience here in Ireland has been over the past year that most categories of recorded crime have decreased uh, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, some very dramatically, uh, statistically, but domestic violence is one of the areas where there has been an increase in uh, reporting levels. And some of that I think is related to the point made by Sonia, which would be similar here regarding the way services for victims of or survivors of domestic violence have been delivered and opportunities that have been created to enable people to report incidences. But it, it, it has been one of the features here that the incidence has increased. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good points, uh, Vivian. Thank you, thank you. Can can I add a couple of points there as, as well? Um, for fear of launching into a long explanation about the organisation of probation in England and Wales, um, lots of people will know that um, probation is at the moment delivered by the National Probation Service, but also these organisations called community rehabilitation companies that broadly work with people who are assessed as posing a medium or lower risk of harm. And the research that I did with colleagues was 
within a community rehabilitation company. Community rehabilitation companies do supervise people with convictions and risk factors for domestic violence. And it was definitely those cases that were the ones where staff were least happy to have to rely on telephone supervision. So in terms of priority cases for wanting to work with, with elements, significant elements of face-to-face -face work, domestic abuse was right at the top of their list, along with those cases where there were concerns about child protection and welfare to children. We could have quite a long conversation about whether you can do risk assessment work adequately if you're not face to face. I, th I think that's an interesting question and may maybe one for later. Yes, very difficult questions, Jane. Uh, with, the, with the risk assessment online, it's uh, it, it's it's quite a, a, a big question. But uh, for the time being, I would like to go back to a, a very important question asked by uh, several uh, participants uh, in the, in the chat: uh, Maria Jimena Monsalve and also Stephanie Collins and also Juliana Carbonaro asked us, uh, "What about the disparities uh, in terms of access to the telephones for the probationers?" How shall we deal with this kind of uh, differential access to resources? Uh, do you think that uh, technology will actually enlarge the disparities uh, in, in the society and also in the experience of supervision for our clients? Well, I can say, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. No, you go, I'll go after you. <laughs> um, with regard to cell phone technology, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, maybe a different uh, problem, more complicated problem for laptop internet um, access and that sort of thing. But as far as cell phone technology concerned, uh, you know, when you go to scale, first of all, there's a high percentage of, of uh, folks on probation in the United States who have cell phones, uh, smartphones. That's a, it's a, the prevalence is higher than I would have expected be. But I think given the benefit and what uh, the costs are if you go to scale, that is, if you buy in bulk uh, cell phones and also the service will, would repay itself. It, you know, you'd get down to, you know, something in the vicinity of a dollar and a half to uh, U.S., you know, a dollar and a half to two dollars a day to subsidize someone who really couldn't uh, uh, afford it. Uh, so that that just speaks to cell phone availability. I think the government needs to invest where uh, it's not available to the person who's under supervision. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Corbett. I think it's a very good point where whereby the the probation services or the state in general should should uh, get involved in facilitating probationers to comply with the telephone supervision. Let's say if they don't have the means to to do so. Nick, you wanted to, to say something? Yeah, I think it's a really, really valid point. There's no wonder so many people have mentioned it. It's something we recognised really early on. Um, and so we actually invested in a, a programme of rolling out mobile phones to um, prison leavers that happened quite early on in the pandemic. Um, and also investing, as Sonia said, in sort of accommodation services as well, because we could have had a lot of prison leavers uh, homeless uh, on release and not been able to, to contact them. I think as well as um, access and affordability, there's also um, questions around sort of the, the advancements in technology for perhaps prison leavers who've been in for a very long time. And so not been able to adapt to using technology, um, you know, and that just adds to the additional stress then on release of how to adapt to being back in the community. So I think if we are going to start using phones as a normal part of probation, then we need to start looking at you know, improving education inside the prison to actually bring them up to speed in terms of how to use technology. Um, and just making sure that it's accessible because if it's not accessible to everyone, then it, then it is going to cause, um, it's going to have a disproportionate impact on people and it's something we need to be mindful of. Absolutely. Yes, and uh, sorry, excuse me, but regarding this topic, I only want to men mention something that we should divide or make a differentiation between access to internet, Wi-Fi and so on, and access to electronic devices. For example, just to mention very briefly an example here in Catalonia, a, a few weeks ago I was talking to the Catalan NGOs that deliver probation services, and actually they are talking about what they call 
digital homeless, a person that although is living in a homeless situation has access to internet or because they have mobile phone and they connect uh, to internet through public spaces with Wi-Fi or uh, with Wi-Fi or because uh, this person has access to public public libraries or other community services that provide internet, free internet for people that need it. So my I'm not sure if we should talk about a uh, virtual divide or different access to internet, different access to technology. Yes, an open question. And this example only to reflect on the situation here in Catalonia. Yes, thank you, Anna. Very good points. It's one thing to have a, a laptop or internet and it's a totally another thing how to use those in order to, to to use it in a kind of meaningful uh, direction. But now I would like to, to pass the floor back to, to Sonia to introduce uh, us to the next uh, topic of discussion. I know that we still have some questions in the chat. We will come back to, the, to them, uh, no panic. Uh, but I, I just want to make sure that we cover all the topics that we uh, promised that we're gonna cover. So Sonia, back to you. Okay, so this is our final um, session this afternoon, um, and it's for me to invite panel members first to ask what they think are their future priorities for tech development um, in probation. From my own point of view, I mean, I think one of the um, important developments is the way um, in which we use our case management systems more in a more smart way to actually use them in a way where we um, are able to um, conduct both <clears throat> better cohort analysis across our whole entire caseloads to understand where the needs are for both interventions, um, but also to use them in a way which tests um, effectiveness, i.e. how we really assess um, levels of outcome Whilst I'm sure we've all had experience of um, assessing progress over time, it's often quite chunky um, and clunky. Um, so for me, um, future investment in probation case management systems, which I think links to one of the important points that Lone made in his presentation would be high on my list. So that's my suggestion. So I'm now gonna hand over to Vivian to give me his wish list on future tech developments. Uh, thanks, Sonia. Um, and um, I, I would agree with the points that you've just made, particularly in, in relation to the need to develop smarter case management uh, systems. I do believe, as I said earlier, and I think others have made the point that the technology is, is here to stay uh, and it's really how well we use it. And I was really struck in that regard by one of the points Ron made that it's not so much about the technology, it's about the hands that that are, that are using the technology at both ends of it, if, 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 uh, if you like. Uh, and that really a probation officer who's a uh, good practitioner and well-trained and so on will be effective uh, in either scenario or in the hybrid, which I think is more likely. I don't envy the challenges facing people like Sonia and Nick uh, trying to lead organizations into a new reality that is really trying to adapt uh, what we've learned over the course of the pandemic and what has been implemented into a situation where, as I see it anyway, and I described earlier, there will be a finding of equilibrium as we go forward because some people will want to keep going in that direction and others will want a complete return to what was before and there will be uh, some people in the middle. In relation to the poverty issue, I, I do think uh, technology poverty is one issue the, just to mention, the wider poverty uh, aspects are also an issue, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm aware that uh, one of the other benefits for people during the pandemic is where, as Ron said, there is a very high uh, uptake of uh, smart uh, ICT um, uh, technology nowadays, uh, generally. Um, that many people, you know, many service users have found that that has helped them uh, in a huge way where they haven't had to pay for 
traveling to the probation officer's office. Um, you know, so there's the other, that other poverty aspect as well as, uh, you know, there's, there's that general poverty issue that affects some people as well as the tech poverty issue, which, which can affect others. So I do think the technology is here to stay and I would hope that uh, services, um, probation services can adapt uh, and ultimately, as Sonia said, uh, focus on the, the effective and appropriate use of technology and how that can be done in whatever our new reality is. Vivian, thank you. New reality, it certainly is. <laughs> OK, I'm going to hand over to Jane. So your observations on future tech development. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, uh, two things, I think. So. Again, the, from our study, the probation practitioners we were talking to didn't have work smartphones. They had work talk and text only phones. They were interested in being able to pilot possibilities about video calling for some of the reasons we've been talking about, about how there are benefits if you are using the telephone to contact someone that you can see them as well as, as hear them. Um, they had some concerns about the sort of protocols and security that would be needed to go with that. Nobody was very comfortable about the idea of, you know, having their images clipped off mobile phone calls. Nobody wanted to find themselves having done a bit of a supervision session and then be on, on YouTube. So one of the recommendations from our report was about careful piloting of the use of video calls specifically as one element of, of blended supervision. The other thing was that there was real appetite in the study to develop the um, resource of mobile phone apps, useful video clips on YouTube, just a whole range of things that you could use for structured probation supervision for one-to-one -one work, where instead of relying on worksheets and written exercises, you could be working with somebody looking at some of the really good online material that there is there about things like drug treatment, alcohol treatment, um, uh, you know, mental well-being, some, some of those things. And and probation staff were keen to have information and recommendations about those sorts of ways of using good quality online resources to en enhance the way they use technology in supervision, noting that there were obstacles there in terms of the internet access available to service users, sometimes things like lack of Wi-Fi in, in probation offices, sometimes things to do with security settings on work devices that meant that it was hard to share those sorts of online resources. And just linking back to some of the other comments, what goes in hand in hand with all of this is technological developments, but also um, encouragement and, and support for staff development. So things about, you know, professional discretion about when in supervision it was good to be using the telephone rather than face-to-face and about things to do with, um, for example, the use of whereabouts data from GPS and other types of tracking things. I thought, you know, I'd really echo Ron's point there that there are some really constructive ways that you can use whereabouts data from people to talk about things like their sleep patterns or their routines at the weekend or the fact that something seems to have changed. But those require staff development training opportunities for mutual learning. <laughs> Jane, thank you. Some really observations, really helpful observations there. And um, I absolutely share your view about how we can get more interactive learning tools available for the people that we supervise. And the same applies to our own staff as well. I mean, another one of the key learning points that we, um, I'm sure, will take away is having transferred um, our core some of our core training onto into virtual classrooms combined with um, some real investment in online learning platforms as well um, and when professionals are very busy to drive halfway across the country to attend a domestic abuse program might just 
it, it's very it puts a lot of additional demand. So I think not only are we mixing up in terms of our approach to um, offender supervision, but also the way in which we support our staff. That's not to say that one-to-one support and cl- real classroom learning will be available. But again, I think we can just mix it up a bit more with new technology. Anyway, Ron, would you like to come back in in terms of your digital wish list? Well, here I'm going to contradict myself and say that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I want a, two cheers for low tech, I guess is what I would say. And what I mean by that is this. Um, in the end, to me, at least my experience tells me there's no substitute for face-to-face pers- uh, meetings in situ. By that, I mean at home. And the reason I say that is because prob- good probation officers can read a home uh, and, and, and uh, while they're contacting, they'll get a sense of, 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 of the whole picture if they're able to get into uh, somebody's living situation. And I don't mean, you know, like you conduct a search or anything. You're just forming impressions as mm-hmm. to how things are going. Also, as I'm old fashioned. Also, if you believe, as I do, and will never stop believing, that it's the probation officer who's the most important intervention, the most important treatment program. I really believe that. Uh, more so than the instrumentation, and God knows, you know, I, I fostered a lot of it when it was my job to do that, and the use of technology, which I obviously believe in, and cell phone. But what I believe in most of all is the power of a good, a probation officer, a fair and decent and firm and supporting probation officer, um, having face-to-face contact in the environment where the uh, probationer lives and operates, um, I think I think is key. So um, that's where I'd want to continue to make the investment. And um, uh it's, it solves the transportation problem that was mentioned earlier, which is a real issue, coming up with money to get here, there, and elsewhere, because as I said earlier, the load of requirements requires people to be all over the place, and transportation is an issue if you're poor. There's no question about that. So I like the idea of, of, of the traditional model of probation officers going to where uh, the probationer lives. Um, and um, while I would like to see the, the cell phone um, uh, stuff as an adjunct, as an, as an assistant probation officer, um, supplementing the work of what good probation officers, because right or wrong, that's where the action is, in my view. What takes place in the space between a person under supervision and the probation officer, how they connect, um, is the key to the whole ball game, in my view. Ron, I certainly wouldn't uh, disagree with that at all. It's about the complementary, isn't it? And absolutely at the core of good probation is a well-trained professional who can really get alongside the individual. Okay, Anna, I think it's your opportunity um, to give me your wish list, list on Future Digital. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we all agreed that we live in a rapidly changing world where technology plays an important role. Uh, technology in probation is rapidly changing and expanding as well. Actually, nowadays, things um, like, the, the, like the technology developments that have already been mentioned, like electronic monitoring uh, apps, virtual reality, are used by probation officers in their daily work something we could have never imagined 10 years ago. We all agree that due to the outbreak of COVID-19 and the impact that the pandemic had or is having in our lives, technology in the probation field, and I might say in all the criminal justice field, became much more important. Some of the innovation in this field that were implemented during the lockdown uh, will definitely stay with us in the coming years. But what sort of technology will we use in 10 years? This is very hard to answer with certainty, but but we can identify some of the priorities or ideas for future technological developments in probation. For example, 
more use of video court sessions and or video meetings in general. For example, in Catalonia, some of the court sessions with juveniles are already taking place online. And I'm sure that in other jurisdictions, they have also implemented the same idea. Also, as uh, already mentioned by Professor Joan Durnescu and Professor Rob Covert, uh, more use of supporting apps for people under probation and more use of user-friendly apps for probation officers to follow service users on electronic monitoring, for example. And some of the examples are in the Netherlands. Uh, they have a very well-developed app for people under probation. Also the app Changing Lives from the Probation Board of Northern Ireland and others. Uh, I would also include more use of electronic monitoring with alcohol consumption detection, for example. Also gaming and virtual reality as a methodology for developing treatment programs. For example, once again, Catalonia developed uh, and it's also implementing a treatment program for domestic violence uh, probationers that uses virtual reality as a treatment methodology and actually it's having uh, very positive results. I would also include in this uh, wish list, as Sonia said, uh, more use of artificial intelligence in development and using of assessment tools. But uh, apart from technology aimed at probationers, we can also identify new technology aimed at training of probation professionals. For example, growing use of online training tools for probation officers like the dialect trainer to train basic probation skills or to gather a specific knowledge like it was identified in the PONT project, which Professor Yuan Durnescu knows it better than I do. And uh, also to mention that ENAP, L'Ecole Nationale d'Administration Nitentiaire in France, is also uh, involved in the development of they call AVA, an autonomous virtual agent for training in assessment interviewing. But well, uh, what is very important and from my perspective is crucial is that together with all these and other technological developments, we do not have to forget the ethical perspective. No matter what technology can do, we must never lose sight of why it is being used or if it needs to be used in certain cases or not at all. All in all, from my perspective, new technology has to be above all ethical and with the aim of improving people's lives. And well, having said so, I think that the last thing I would like to mention very briefly is that uh, from the CP side, we have an expert group on technology in probation. And uh, well, just to mention that the first meeting was in 2017 and the aim of this expert group is to improve the coordination and cooperation between CP members regarding the wide uh, aspect of ongoing technological innovations in probation. Um, and uh, I would like to invite uh, our audience to visit the CP website where you will find further information on, on the topics we are just discussing today. Thank you, Sonia. Anna, you've given us many wishes there and lots of food, 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 food for thought. And I was particularly delighted that you mentioned the issue of ethics and the application of how we use technology, really important observation. We're coming up to time now, so I'm going to hand back to Leon for you to make the closing remarks um, from today's um, event. It's great to see that we held the audience's participation, um, the people who joined this event are still with us. So thank you to everyone who listened today and your questions. So I'm going to hand over to my co-chair for final comments and observations. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Sonia. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for these interesting uh, discussions. Um, uh, as I have the floor, I would also like to to, to reflect a little bit on uh, uh, on on your question, Sonia, about uh, what what is my wish list for for the, <laughs> for the technology. You see, <laughs> I uh, there are some privileges of being a co-chair. So. Um, <laughs> Yes, I, I think it's it's really for me it's really important uh, to uh, to to be aware of the fact that uh, uh, we 
we had a, we 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 were in in the face of a kind of uh, natural experiment in the last year and i think we were pushed to ex- to to test and to experiment a lot of new ways of doing running the business and i think it's really really important to take this opportunity and to learn as much as possible from from this opportunity and see how we can really progress with our services in the future for instance uh, i i heard many times and i think we have already com- uh, some evidence that compliance rates are better breach rate uh, rates are uh, lower uh, there are uh, uh, quite a, a lot uh, uh, probationers stating that they are opening up uh, easier uh, online than in a face-to-face interaction. So I think we we have a lot of things to uh, to learn from this experience, and I think some of our uh, participants uh, mentioned in the in the chat, like for example Daniela Nud mentioned that. Uh, uh, this kind of um, uh, interaction, on, online interactions were easier for, for a lot of our clients. And we should look into that and see why was that, for whom, in what circumstances, and so on. And then after, the, after this pandemic will, will be gone, we will be able to, to retain what is good from this experience of, of supervision online uh, and then you know, move on uh, uh, in, a, in a different level, let's say. Uh, to conclude for, for the, the discussions that we had, I think it's, it's really important to, to mention, as, as Vivian uh, said a, a few times, that technology is here to stay. We, we have to admit that. I think it's, uh, it's, it's obvious. Um, but it's also obvious that technology is, it should not be a, an end, end in itself. It should not be a name for itself. Uh, it should rather be a kind of adjuvant for the probation officers to do their job better. Uh, as, uh, as Professor Corbett mentioned, probation officers are the intervention. So they should be supported with, uh, with, the, with the technology, with the environment, with the online environment eventually, to make their job better. Because uh, uh, as he also said very beautifully, and I saw that uh, people in the chat also uh, greeted him for that, um, their success is our success. And I think... Uh, by uh, by saying that we can close this uh, interesting seminar i think we learn a lot uh, and i think it's uh, we we can end on a kind of positive note that technology can really help and can really make us uh, uh, better in our job because uh, better stuff has better clients and uh, let's hope we're going to be able to use technology to that in that direction thank you very much thank you Uh, every one of you. It was a real pleasure. I learned a lot. Thank you uh, participants uh, with their beautiful, interesting questions in the chat. And I hope to see you soon uh, in the near future. Thank you. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.